This community needs this church. This world needs this church. This world needs Christians that are letting their light shine, that are not ashamed of the gospel, but are very thankful for what Jesus has done and live to just naturally, supernaturally let that flow into everyday conversations. This is the best news, it's the good news, and we can never let the good news become old news. Amen? You're good and I've witnessed it. You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it. And I'm confident I'll see it again. To the broken, I'll witness it. To the hurting, I'll witness it. To the lost, I will witness it. You've been so good. We will live in your fullness and we will give witness to your love to everybody we possibly can. Come on, with passion, let's make it shareable. I want this to be an anthem of our church, the goodness of God, the strength, the consistency of God, the love, the healing, salvation. Most everybody in this room, you've witnessed it. Now give witness to it, amen? The cross was my cross. The shame he bore, the sin, my shame, my sin. But he sacrificially mounted that cross. He had the power to come down, but he didn't. And out of love that is unconditional, he paid the price so that I could be forgiven, so that you could be forgiven. I couldn't get to him. He made his way to me. From heaven all the way to earth and shed his own blood so that I could be born anew, born again, raised to a whole new life. It's too good to not share it. Don't let the good news become old news. You, you know, there was a day I talked a lot about Krispy Kreme. They were crispy, they were creamy, and they were like the new deal. I would pull in when the hot light came on, get a dozen, hit the first parking spot, and smash that dozen of donuts and testify to everybody that I could. Now I never talk about them. I talk about donuts, just not Krispy Kreme. It's like it's old news. Hey, the good news of Jesus it is too good, it is eternal, it is life changing. Don't let the good news become old news. Come on, let's just set it off right from the beginning. Come on, he's good. His grace, his mercy. Come on, give love to Jesus. It's gonna stay fresh with us, God. That's it, it's gonna stay fresh. Come on, give God praise. He has been so good. That's it, just a renewal, the joy of our salvation, the blessing of Jesus in our lives. We praise you, Lord, and we will not be silent. The text takes us today to the book of Mark, chapter two. Jesus has come home. It says a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. I believe we can be so quick to share this good news that on a weekend there won't be an empty seat, and it's because Jesus is in the house and the word is being preached and truth is setting people free. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get, to get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, not the man on the mat, not his faith, but the people who had brought him to Jesus, when Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Please let that be fresh word to you today. The son of man, Jesus, has authority on earth to forgive sins. And no one else does. And this exclusive claim is not arrogant or narrow or mean-spirited. It is a gift. There's no other name. There's no other one. There's no other religion. There's no other source that can forgive sins. Only that level of authority rests with Jesus. Praise God for Jesus, his sacrifice, and his open door so that our sins could be forgiven. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. That last uh, part, we have never seen anything like this. Another version says it in these words. What we have seen here today is remarkable. An antonym of remarkable is unremarkable, like just kind of flat, nothing, routine, the Lord wants the assembly to walk in the remarkable, miracle, life-changing authority of Jesus so that when we leave this place, we can say Jesus was in the house, the word was preached, signs and wonders followed, miracles happened, people were saved, shame was broken, the addicted were set free, and then we bolt out of this place with fresh passion to share the good news between Sundays. Be remarkable. Our dependency on Jesus, our passion for God, our desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we aren't remarkable in our human effort, in our talent, in our technology, in our buildings, and in our budget, or even in our attendance. Jesus is what makes it remarkable. Grace is what makes us remarkable. Because we're marked by the authority of Jesus so we can say, my sins are forgiven. My sins are washed away. I'm not who I was. My past is not my future. I'm gonna get loud for a second because no one else has the authority to break the power of sin and its shame. I'm set free today. I'm walking in peace and purpose and power because of Jesus. Be excited about Jesus. Be thankful for Jesus. Let your heart overflow with Jesus. Be so full of Jesus that you witness from the overflow of your life. Amen. These four men, they had faith in the authority of Jesus. Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is not in our program. Our faith is in Jesus. Our faith is that he and he alone can change people's lives. And so we as a church will do anything, any barrier, any roof in this modern day, any ideology, anything that is blocking people from the experience of forgiveness and healing is where the church will be found breaking that barrier down removing that barrier for people to come into this experience of salvation 
We will have a whatever it takes attitude. We will risk, commit, work. We will take action. We will not hold this belief of the goodness of God and do nothing with it. As we said last week, we will not remain silent. We will do everything we can to break those barriers down so that people can have that moment that is infused with the authority of Jesus, where from that moment they are never the same again. Whether it be a Zacchaeus, a woman of Samaria, Matthew, a tax collector, or the demoniac, all of them found Jesus can do what no one else can do. That Jesus will help you, but he will not only help you, he'll transform you. That Jesus will radically change your life. That demoniac who was put in his right mind, no one else could help him, but Jesus can do what no one else can do. Jesus can help and Jesus can heal and Jesus can transform. And so God, we look for those moments where you can infuse it with that kind of authority. And then we live in the remarkable. We live in that supernatural. We live like an Acts, a Book of Acts church. I am burdened because there's more than a billion people that wake up and continue their pursuit as Muslims. I don't criticize their pursuit. I'm broken in my heart by what they're pursuing. A pursuit that says if they can sacrifice enough, if they can serve enough, they can make their way to God. If you've been in certain places, the day will start with like this moan and it's the call to prayer. And they are on their knees and on their face and they'll do that five times throughout that day and convenience stores or airports or right on the street. When that call goes out in their devotion, they submit because they're on a pursuit. Hindus are very different. They believe in reincarnation. Yet another billion are caught in that pursuit, believing that if they can live a good enough life, they can then come back in another life form. And if that one's good enough and they can string enough of them together, that they will earn eternal life, maybe even be a God themselves. I can take you to Dhaka, the most populated city in the world, and I could introduce you to a young lady in her 30s, a young man in his 30s. They're now husband and wife. But when this young lady was 19, she got into a confrontation with a friend, and another person stepped in and just talked to them about getting over it, making it right, and talked about forgiveness. And this, this girl, I'd never heard anybody talk about forgiveness like that. So she inquired more about that whole idea. Through that, she was invited to a gathering of Christians because what that, that conversation was about was coming from Matthew 18 about forgiving. She had never heard. She, had never, she now can say, I was sensing love that I'd never known before. And in that gathering of Christians, over time, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. This immediately, once her parents found out, excommunicated her from her family. A threat was put on her life. The church campus there is similar to this, you know, some 15, 20 acres. We we're on about 40 here, so just to give you an idea. And for two years after her salvation, she never left that church campus because they could keep her safe there. If she stepped off that campus, they didn't know if she would be taken and killed. Yet the love of Jesus so profound. See, in everybody's heart, everybody on this planet, it's like a beacon. If you fly on a plane, they will tell you about the flotation device, and if you ever have to use it, there's a beacon that will go off trying to indicate to people where you are and set up a rescue. There is a beacon going off in every human heart because God has written eternity in every heart. And it will continue to go off, and people will seek to try and find what would fill that void. And over a billion are pursuing Muhammad over a billion are Hindu, but the beacon 
keeps going off because there is no answer. There is no supply. There's no provision. There's no portion in that false pursuit. I do not criticize the pursuit. I'm gripped by the fact that they're pursuing the wrong thing. And so for this young lady, she found that Jesus filled her heart. Simultaneously, whole different place, there's a young man raised as a Hindu. That's all he ever knew. And he too had gotten introduced to Jesus and had found Christ as his Savior. Both of them discipled over a period of years, and as God would have it, they met. And now this former Muslim and former Hindu husband and wife have children now and are leading ministry. And they will tell you that when Jesus found them, they had to learn, and this is critical, God made us, God made us and we're here on purpose. We're here by him and for him, but here's the deal, we can't get to God. But where Christianity separates from all other religions, where in all the other religions, you have to figure it out and make your way to God. In Christianity, the central message is that God comes to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Jesus came and it's, it's the will and the passion of Jesus that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance and so Jesus rescues us, comes to us, lifts us, changes us. He leaves the 99 and goes after the one. There is no other story like this. There is no other news like this. Religion is about what you do. Christianity is about what Jesus has done. He paid the price so that you could be forgiven and healed and free. <laughs> Where right now the enemy is working, trying to set up the church as being bigoted and, and mean-spirited because we say there's one name. It is the greatest gift because Jesus was willing to do what no one else can do. Be reminded today of whose you are. The king of glory from eternity past stepped into time and space and gave his life a ransom for many and opened up a door. And all you have to do is open your heart and put your faith in his grace. While at the same time, there's another billion that are adhering to an eight-fold path and four truths presented to them by Buddhism. And unlike the Muslims that are trying to reach God through service and sacrifice, you find this is about self-reflection, self-awareness, and trying to get to a place within yourself that you set it right within yourself. Show you a picture of a young man. This is Tim and his wife. They are now the associate pastors of the church in Bangkok that we partner with. We were there just three weeks ago. Tim, just 17 years ago, was on the streets of Bangkok, a Buddhist addicted to drugs and selling drugs. And he said, this man came along who was just different. And in his words where he was overflowing with Jesus and began to witness to him, spend time with him. And it was that interaction that led Tim to knowing Jesus as his savior. That man was the pastor of the church who planted the church, who went in just about 25 years ago and started planting that church. A few years in, he met this guy on the streets. He invited Tim to move into their home where he discipled him for two years. Now, 17 years later, this young man has a beautiful family and they love Jesus. And he is kind of like the, the executive pastor of three different campuses and when you come into their auditorium, probably about the size of this middle section, 
all of these, these young professionals, former Buddhists, most are first generation Christian. No one else in their family. They're the first followers of Jesus for generations. And it all started with Tim and a, and a pastor who was just overflowing with Jesus. See, if, I, if we can experience that, that goodness to where we're just overflowing in the goodness, then our conversation will be natural and then supernatural. I don't have to... I don't have to work on my presentation, though I'm not against thinking through how you would present it. I'm not so regimented that I'm trying to dot I's and cross all of the T's. You see, I'm just a witness. I've witnessed his love, his consistency, faithfulness, goodness, healing, and salvation. Now I will just naturally give witness to it. Anything that we love, that we are impressed by, that we're drawn to, we talk about it. We initiate. We bring it up. And we just connect it in the conversations that we have. Holy Spirit, immerse us again in such power. What's the role of the Holy Spirit? To exalt Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit exalts Jesus in your heart, where your spiritual eyes are just staying in the story of his crucifixion and his resurrection. That you're not who you were because of Jesus. You have a life beyond words because of Jesus. Then you will initiate naturally, but yet supernaturally because the Holy Spirit is going to give you words in season. And Jesus is going to be shared and people will be drawn just overflowing with Jesus. Overflowing. I said to those in the nine o'clock service, I felt I, I got a word from God right at the end. And I just said, be the branch. He's the vine. We're the branches. And if we are abiding in the vine, the flow of power, the fullness of Jesus, and then we bear fruit, and that fruit is, it's excess life. There's so much life that there is the bearing of fruit. And if you and I are walking with Jesus, then we will so effectively, so naturally just let the light shine. We will season conversations with the salt of his grace, with what he's done in our own lives. Because as we have all journeyed with Jesus, here's what we know, we're not who we were, but he's still working on us. And he never gives up on us. And when we fall short, he doesn't turn his back and wash his hands of us. So we can talk about a God of a second chance because we didn't even deserve the first chance. But in his goodness, in his love, he stepped in. Oh, may God restore the joy of our salvation. May God remember, help us to remember the rescue the redemption, the, the resurrection life. My God, where would we be but for the grace of God? And can we so live abiding in the vine that we bear fruit, we bear more fruit, we bear much fruit for the kingdom of God? Be the branch. Be the branch, be the branch. And I say, let, let nothing stop you. Don't let familiarity stop you. Don't let the good news become old news. And don't let pressure stop you. Don't let fear stop you. The fear of if I get into this conversation, it could be socially awkward. Dear God, let's be immersed in the kind of power 
that gives us excitement and boldness. Like just looking forward to naturally letting the love of Jesus show up in these interactions that we have throughout the day, throughout the week. I'm burdened that we wouldn't let nothing stop us because eternity hangs in the balance. I'm so thankful as I spend time with Tim and his family that Daniel, the pastor of the church, was just doing his day overflowing with Jesus. And he wasn't unwilling to share Jesus with someone who was steeped in a false religion, who was addicted to drugs, who could have been written off. That pastor made his way through the barriers. And any time you work your way through the barriers, just like those four men worked their way through the roof, you know that was messy. Ministry in this generation will be messier than ever. But don't fear the mess. Don't fear it. Jesus is greater. Jesus can not only forgive people, he can heal people. He can get them off the mats of their misery and their despair. And let's just step in to the mess with them and let Jesus do the ministry of life change. Let nothing stop you, us, nothing. I bring up Daniel, the pastor of the church, and his wife Paulina because 26 years ago they were in another country as missionaries and they were kidnapped by the militia who would become the leaders of ISIS in that region simply because of their faith, thrown into a dungeon. They're from Sweden. They were thrown into a dungeon and was there. they were there 165 days. Most days of the week, they would pull Daniel out of the dungeon to beat him. They were starving them. It got so desperate that when they would come for Daniel, he and his wife would say goodbye because he thought, I, I won't live through this one. Through a supernatural set of circumstances, they were able to get free and to get home. I'll talk a little bit more about their story. I'll, I just want though for you to hear a little bit from him and, and I, I just wanna tell you my experience that when I met them and I said, I want you to tell me about it all. I was gripped by the authority of Jesus in them such humility, but such peace, such poise. What kind of trauma do you have to get over when you've been held captive in a dungeon for 165 days, beaten most of those days? And after just a brief time, that missionary, after being at home, that missionary call continued to stir and they felt led to Bangkok. That's who was overflowing with Jesus when Tim got saved. Now these three campuses, and this man could have been so far from God and so far from overflowing with Jesus. And I got a, a firsthand look at what the power of Jesus can do in our lives. And again, it was, it was way more caught than anything, just the, the sense of the authority, the power, the love of Jesus in this man. We'll have them come here and tell the whole story in the not too distant future, but just, just listen to some of these statements. The reason why we were abducted initially was because we were working with the church and they wanted to destroy the church. But then we were trafficked and sold to Chechen militia and who kept us to make money on us. But the hardest thing is not being beaten. 
hardest thing is not the lack of food. The hardest thing is that you, your freedom and your freedom of choice is taken away from you. You don't have a prison sentence that you know has an end date, but you have no clue how long you will stay. And it was so dark. And we held on to each other. Said, maybe this is our last day, but we're going to worship God. And many times we felt like our feet, we were in hell and captivity and darkness. But through the worship of our mouth, our hearts could, could lift up out of the darkness and enter into the presence and the heaven of God. What we were reminded of was that God saw us. God knew about us. God heard every word we spoke about. He was with us in this dungeon. Several statements that he made stayed with me. He talked about the actual darkness, but he said the greater, more thicker darkness was the, the oppressive spirit of the enemy. And he said it was the Holy Spirit just helped generate a choice within us that if we get this day, we will worship God. And he said these words to me, and I, I've thought about it for over a year. He said, Ron, you know, the Bible talks about on earth as it is in heaven. And he said, I've heard that all my whole Christian life. But he said, in that dungeon, as we would worship God, he said, I experienced on earth in that dungeon the heavenly glory and presence of God. Did you hear his language? It, like, it lifted us to the heavens of God, but he said it was heaven on earth. Isn't the church, we know how this whole thing ends, and we are very excited and anticipating the coming of Jesus. And there will be a catching away. It's called the rapture. And we will forever be in the presence of God. That's how this story ends. We're not doing this for victory. We're in victory. The victory has been won. So now, until then, shouldn't it be as it is in heaven? Let it be on earth. No addiction in heaven. No sickness in heaven. No brokenness in heaven. So God, we know that one day we're leaving here and going there, but until then we need some of there to come down here. So that your church is so overflowing with Jesus that people who have been generations in in false religion will have their spiritual eyes open that they may see. They may see and respond. That there would be a church that will stop at nothing, do whatever it takes for that encounter where Jesus infuses that authority of forgiveness and healing. Let nothing stop. I just I want to say this. Be the branch Abide in Jesus and wreck the roof. Get through every barrier winsomely in the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want to pastor you so well that at the judgment seat where all Christians, not the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat where it's not about if you're going to heaven, it's about rewards. Where you stand before Jesus and you give an account for this one life. I want to pastor in such a way that that's your best day. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how Jesus is going to call us one by one. You know, the Olympics are coming, the gold medal moment. Where, where you you compete, you win, and you get you get the reward. I don't know if he's gonna alphabetize us and call us one. I hope I'm not anywhere around the Apostle Paul. I'm a woods. I should be okay. Imagine Paul going before the Lord and he gives an account, and it's city after city. Can you imagine in the background? the jailer and his family, they just speak up and say, hey, we're here because of you. 
Can you imagine? See, you and I will stand before Jesus and all that will matter is how we lived in the overflow of his love to us so that others can know. That's it. That's what will matter. So I harness now my skill set Whatever job I'm in, the relationships I have, everything, everything. I am having eternity in my mind. And I'm saying in all of these spheres of influence, these, these places and spaces where my life goes, it's my ministry. And I'm going to take Jesus into those places. Can I get a yes in this house?